yeah. And that was back in the days when he was a fireman and not, mm -hmm. there was absolutely no political. Right. Well, I guess it was maybe political, but in, in his, had nothing to do with his outwardly politics. Right, right. More, more about the, you know, the political action committee where they'd help uh, to do a lot of good around town for many years, including, you know, Victoria and, and people before Victoria. Uh, He's the reason I did a, uh, I did a ride along with the fire department. I decided I was going to be a fireman. Wow. And then I got my EMT and then I was like, well, this other opportunity came up with USC and they have this inaugural entrepreneurship program and I can either focus and try to go there or continue to try to be a fireman. And then now I have bad knees um, and ankles. And so I was talking to Daryl Talbert at the time and he's like, well, Scotty, if you join and you're a fireman, he's like, you could probably do it, but you'll be a liability because you got issues. Right. And I'm like, all right, well, that just decided that I'm going to USC <laughs> and wow. that's and so anyway but thanks to him I, I did that and uh, we were working out at UFC for a little while but yeah I got a tremendous amount of respect for that guy and when he told me he was getting into you know the pol the politics I was like Jim are you sure you want to do <laughs> that man like you know whatever you say you could have the best intention for and somebody right. with a different agenda is going to take this little piece of those words yeah. and spin it and slap you upside the face with it and he's like yeah but if not me who and i was like so two things about that uh, one is that i helped open that ufc gym i was the uh the, i was the the uh, oldest male trainer there and i was invited personally recruited by the now president of ufc gyms worldwide to be a trainer there because I had a reputation in town for helping people get in shape. And when he first came and said, we're gonna open a gym in Corona, he wrote to the mayor, Karen Spiegel, and said, who do I need to know? Said, you better connect with Saul. And uh, so we had a good friendship for a long time and I helped open that gym. And uh, The other thing is when Jim was thinking about running for office, uh, we went to lunch. And he said, hey, I know you've already announced you're gonna run. and you know, let's talk this out, and we had a nice conversation, and agreed to ground rules right up front that we wouldn't. So you guys were running against each other? At the time, we were both planning on running against each other, <clears throat> and then two more people announced that they would run, and I, at that time, my business was exploding, and we, it wasn't even time to officially announce that you're running uh, on paper. Uh, I, I mean, I literally announced a year before you can take out papers and was in the parade and everything. But uh, then I went that year of the election, 2018, I guess, and, uh, and said, I can't, uh, I, I won't be able to run because my business is exploding and I need, need to focus on our nationwide expansion. Um, and, that, and then that's when I told people what I did because everyone just thought I was just a retired volunteer because I never, you know, you never saw me at work. You never saw, I never announced what I did. Never, nobody, if you didn't ask, I didn't share. Of course, I don't tell people who my clients are. It's very confidential. Unless they brag about me, then, I, then I'll, you know, chime in. <laughs> so, uh, so what is it that you do while we're, while we're here? Uh, well, uh, so I'm wearing the Living Better 101 shirt which is, is really what it's all about, is helping people live better through fixing financial issues. So uh, our, our flagship company, Living Better 101, helps people restore their credit, and mostly through credit education, what went wrong, what can be done to make that right, and we, we actually help people get things deleted from their credit file permanently. And that helps them, of course, live better because they're going to pay less for things that will have a higher score. And that helps their life in other ways. Uh, the other two divisions have uh, Liberate Debt, which helps people uh, get free of the debt through alternative means than what they thought or didn't know they were signing up for. Give me an example. So an example would be private student loans, where people are sometimes paying... I have clients paying 11 or 12 percent even today, and some who uh, upwards of 16 percent. Variable student loan interest rates 
same banks that would lend government money at 3 to 6.8 percent, charging students triple when it's a private loan because they're, they use the banking laws. They're not required by the congressional rates on what they charge. So those people are sometimes paying for 40 years for less than five years of college. Very unfair. So I've gained a nationwide reputation for myself and for the company, Liberate Debt, on that scale because we've taken on some very massive uh, banks with some very unfair practices. Help people get some really significant relief. Sometimes as little as half of what they were scheduled to pay uh, with interest. Um, hmm. And then our third division is uh, Ed Solutions Unleashed. And that company helps people navigate federal student loans. So we help people get on track for forgiveness. Uh, we have clients from age 17 to in their 80s. Uh, those people in their 80s still paying for their loans or for their children's loans. And again, there's not enough education about how to navigate forgiveness. And I'll give you an example. Uh, many people know about tenure forgiveness if you're in a public service job. But the company in charge of that, who just announced they're quitting the business, the only company that the Department of Education contracts to do that work, uh, gives people a fail grade 96 to 98 percent of the time on their student loan forgiveness application, meaning that less than 10,000 people in the last 13 years have actually got their 10-year forgiveness on a program that all of those millions of people went to school thinking they wouldn't be paying on their loans after 10 years. Hmm. But if you don't ask for help as you go, you're not getting credit most of the time towards your forgiveness. Uh, just, just like if you, if you, you have a low-paying job, maybe you're a single parent, you're supporting your family at home. If you don't ask the IRS for your refund, they're not coming looking for you. They're, they're, it's there, it's yours, but only if you apply for it. Uh, and you may even get more back than you paid in, like under the earned income credits for having a, uh, you know, for supporting a, a household. Same with federal student loans. If you don't ask for a, a payment adjustment, there's nothing to be forgiven. You just pay, and you just keep paying. Hmm. Um, so I'm really passionate about helping people with that. And, and even knowing the law, reading 16-page promissory notes, and understanding exactly how to fill out government forms myself, it took me till my youngest daughter's third year in college before I can convince the student aid department to actually give her all of the aid she was entitled to and not just the amount they thought they could basically get away with. And it involved them changing my application without my knowledge um, because they thought they knew what the correct answers were. So for example, we had a foster daughter at the time and they didn't count her because I'm a taxes. It said, you know, it asked for a relationship with the other dependents and put foster daughter. They said, well, foster children aren't, aren't, they, they don't count in your household for federal student aid. I said, well, I'm her legal guardian. Oh, well, you didn't say that. Like, <laughs> it doesn't ask that on the application. You, 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 my tax return isn't part of your application. And there's no place on the tax return to check a box legal guardian. It's not part of that. So they took that money out of my daughter's aid because they just subtracted the kid off. And I had another child I was supporting, a niece, and um, so they asked how many kids do you have in college, and I put two, and they changed it to one. And I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know how many kids from my household are going to college right now. Because <laughs> I remember, I went to San Diego, dropped one kid off, got her moved <laughs> into her dorm, got back, dropped everyone off at home, went to the other kid's dorm, finished moving her in. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I got two kids in college right now that I'm helping to support, and they live here at my house. Well, we, we only counted one because the other one didn't apply for the age she was entitled to. So because she didn't ask for extra loans, you're gonna deny my kid all the loans she's entitled to. Yes, that's how it works. Whoa. Uh, good to know. That, that is ridiculous. Yeah. So you fought with them in yeah, so then they finally, you know, but they still, they ended up auditing me all four years of her undergraduate uh, degree. And 
you know, now I knew, you know, to make them correct it. And they don't tell you when they correct it, by the way. They don't, you know, because on the third year, I'm like, what? Well, this is supposed to be a random audit. How am I getting audited three years in a row when you only audit like less than a quarter of the people? And you've never found a mistake, have you? Wait, have you? And so that's when they revealed what they'd done the previous two years. I'm like, well, can my kid have that money back at add it to her loans or whatever? No, it's too late. Yeah, you have to apply by the end of the school year. Well, you should tell people when you change their numbers. I mean, that's just not right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Dang, man. <laughs> so, so I have a mission to help people understand their debt so that their kids don't need my help when they go off to college, let alone when they get out of college. So, But it sounds like you have a two-part system. One is helping them get all of the aid that they're entitled to, and then on the back side, whatever they can do to basically pay it off more the most efficiently that's up to the, the letter of the law. Right. So, for example, if you're not in public service, instead of having 10 years to get forgiveness, it takes 20 to 25 years. Well... Uh, as of the end of last year, 1.2 million people had reached their 20 or 25 year mark, depending on the type of loans. 32 people had achieved their actual forgiveness out of 1.2 million who might have been eligible. 32 nationwide. Wow. So very bleak numbers. So people can't navigate that on their own. You know, people who never got below a, a B or C in college are getting a double F by failing at the 96% level with the government servicer to get their forgiveness. So we have a lot of work to do and we help a lot of people do wow. that. And are you on a retainer? Is it a flat fee? How do you, how do so you charge people for I that? I have lawyers on staff, but I don't have lawyers working on individual cases. So, so we're not on retainer, but people pay a one-time enrollment for their credit education or their debt education and then a monthly subscription uh, for as little or as long as they need help. Some people will stay with us till their loans are forgiven or resolved, uh, and the same with the credit. Some people just want to get, you know, from the below 500 to, to get to 680, and other people sign up in the 700s and they want to get to 800. You know, whatever their goal is, we'll match that uh, month to month. We're literally going to earn their business every month. Got it. And then what made you decide to get into that? Get into that was, so what, were you already doing that on that third year of college or was that what? Uh, so that's interesting. I, I actually, I, I got a call from, from one of our partners, um, gosh, uh, probably six or seven years ago about what they were looking to do. That they saw people had some companies they could choose from with their, their federal loans. Nobody was helping people with their private loans. And my partners had already established Living Better 101. So they said, we need someone who's really good with math, who won't break the law, won't lie to customers. And you fit that bill, and you, you seem to be in a transition period. Would you come to work and help us solve this problem nationwide? So I did, and I've really enjoyed uh, that work. And before that, you were helping people get into shape, or where? So yeah, yeah. So I, I was running uh, a couple of different um, health programs around town. Uh, one was a boot boot camp style program, and prior to that, I had uh, uh, taught some classes at the yoga den, uh, giving people uh, healthier ways to live. Uh, you know, Lisa, yep. and. Um, Prior to that, I had worked at a few different gyms, including UFC gym. I had asked me to come on board when they opened in Corona to, uh, you know, to, to, actually I was a, a to kind of a combination trainer and, and ambassador for UFC gym. It seems that you have a history of doing things to help others, which is, I think, a big reason why we're talking, right? And I know that there's more that we're going to get into, but... But I'm, I just wanted to kind of paint the backstory and kind of what you're doing now because I know there are people that know you that don't really know your story that I think this would be, I think it would be good for them, for people to know because you do have a history of helping people. But why did you get into helping people get healthier? 
what what was what what spurred you into that so i spent uh, that i can document 17 years in a row gaining 10 pounds a year i would go to my dad's house uh, once a year i'd get on his medical scale 10 pounds more than the year before and i'd see okay well that's not even a pound a month no big deal until I got to the point where the scale was maxed out and the, both bars were moved all the way to the backs and still wouldn't register. So um, that was a problem, you know, that the <laughs> scale could no longer measure me. Now, of course, you, got, you go everywhere and there's scales that are industrial size, but at the time that was a pretty big eye opener. So I, I kind of knew I had to do something. There was this TV show we used to watch about uh, weight loss contest with uh, big people and you'd win a bunch of money. And I thought about applying for it, and I sat down at the computer at my family's urging to do it, and as I'm going through the application, I see at the end it says, oh, you need to make a video. Now, I've seen the videos at the end of the show when people get kicked off. It's a funny video about how big they are, and I didn't want to make that video. So I had a dilemma between being too big, not wanting to lose too much weight, because I really want to be on the show but uh, not wanting to make the video. So one day um, I'd gone to the gym, the uh, local gym, and I'd taken my kids from elementary school over there and they had a contest, a poster, big poster, life size, about this big uh, contest they were doing. And I came home and my, my daughter's friend her mother came over said, you, you, you know, the girls went to the gym today with you. Did you see the poster? No. Well, we got this ad in the magazine for this. You get paid to lose weight, you know, first, second, third place. And uh, I said, well, I can do that. In fact, I'll take first place. <laughs> and uh, they're like, you know, what do you mean? No, we're going to take first place. I'm like, I promise you, I will take first place. Someone's <laughs> going to pay me to lose weight. I'm in, right? So that's what got me into the competition. And the first day I go to weigh in, and the scale can't measure me. And the, the coach is all embarrassed, and oh, I'm sorry, I brought the wrong scale. I'm like, just tell me what the weight limit is on your scale. I promise you I'll fit on your scale next week. Do not bring the other scale. And so that first week I lost a lot of weight because I wanted to fit on that scale. I didn't want the special scale. Wow. And in that three months, 13-week uh, contest, I lost 50 pounds. And then I went on to continue to lose weight uh, over the course of a year. Uh, a few uh, really important people in town joined me. Karen Spiegel, I remember, came on board the next contest, and she uh, she wanted to lose uh, a significant amount of weight that year. We even bought an ad in, in the Chad Zeller Memorial book about three months before our year was up. We paid for this ad that said, hey, I'm, I'm down 50 pounds, she's down 50 pounds. I'm down 100 pounds. That's that's what the ad said. Ask me how. And uh, we got to that date, and we were both down just just a fraction below what we promised in that ad. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, don't belong to this gym. Not advertising. <laughs> but that was that, and that, and it was 51 weeks after I had announced at that same place that I was going to be going to a weight loss contest that day. And that day I had run not just the 5K or walked, but also the 1K, which you know was not a thing to do both. I'd done both. And that was the day I weighed in. After having done six kilometers, which was a big deal for me, and having eaten almost nothing, I still couldn't fit on the scale. Oh, wow. So um, after three rounds of this 12, 13 week contest, uh, with with this coach teaching us what to do, the daily habits you could change, why certain things work, why certain things don't work. After the after after fifty two weeks, I had developed two new habits a week uh, that I was willing to do. Out of the ten habits or whatever she would teach each week, I would take two that I could live with over the course of forever was my idea. And so after a year, I had 101 ways to lose 101 pounds. And 
So I said, well, are we going to have another contest? We're now at the one-year anniversary. She goes, no. I'm handing over the keys to you that you have far surpassed what I can teach you. You're going to be leading the contest from now on. So I called it the Big Loser Contest. Similar, but not exactly. Name of the TV show. Mm-hmm. And I used that to, uh, to to train people around town. I did that for probably close to a thousand people in town. The city got on board uh, because not just the mayor, but also the vice mayor, Eugene, uh, was also on board and joined me in the contest. Oh, wow. And very supportive of what I was doing and said, we're going to tell the whole city about what you're doing. And I said, well, let's charge for it because if people are get, getting this for get free. Get a little skin in the game. Right. And so they said, well, let's do one more time free and then, you know, you figure out what you want to charge. So I said, if this is free, you don't have a room big enough in the city to fit the contest. And Karen kind of laughed at me and said, well, I'll, I'll make you a bet. I said, I'll tell you what, I will not fit the, you give, give me the city council chambers, I will not fit everyone in that room. First week in the contest. So she accepted that bet. $100 to your favorite charity, whoever loses. And uh, the first week, the entire city council chambers was full, 242 capacity, if I remember right. And they had to open up the community room, and I was actually bouncing <laughs> between both rooms and That's putting great. my guest speakers on. And Karen made a check to my favorite charity at the time, hmm. yeah, which I think was Hunter Mile Club, which I also introduced to adults in town, and that became a regular thing for people to join not just what their kids were doing in school. I'm sure if you went to school in Corona Norco, you heard about 100 Mile Club. Yep. Well, I I wanted that shirt. I wanted my 25 miles. I wanted the medal, whatever. And uh, Kara was gracious enough to let me have a T-shirt for my 25 miles. And now they have adults or kids can join all over the country and in several foreign countries, too. Wow. So... That's pretty cool. What I tell people is, is if you can get in trouble with money, we can fix it. There's only one thing we can't fix. You want to know what it is? What is that? It's the one thing you won't tell me you've done with your finances. If, if you tell me about it, I can help you fix it. Okay? That's the only time. Is the, the, Sometimes someone lands a surprise on us six months, a year, two years after we've been working with them. Oh, I did this thing, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, you could well, have told me about that two years yeah, ago. Yeah, we would have protected you. We would right. have set things up in order for to prepare for something like this. Right. But if you didn't mention it. Right. Or a lawsuit, right? So someone gets sued, but they don't mention it right away. And you got like 21 days, maybe in some counties and states, maybe 30 days tops. Things are a whole lot different after, and and then it's even worse after someone doesn't go to court. So we can fix that uh, pretty much any stage of the lawsuit, but it just, gets, it just keeps getting more expensive if we don't know soon enough, right? Or like I looked at a case today where the people this woman hired literally did nothing. And she went back and looked at their, at their document storage, found where she sent them a demand letter that said, if you don't do certain things, 30 days, we're going to sue you. And they could have, still in that 30 days, they could have done something, and they didn't. And they still now, six months later, have done nothing. So now she has a default judgment, which, you know, I'm going to help her fix. I got people that drive that lane. They're really good in that space, but it just, she, she didn't know. Yeah. You know, so you, you try to trust whoever you're working with. And that's why, it, it, while we do this work nationwide, you know, now people that are around town who have known me for a long time or know of me are now coming out of the woodwork because now they, they know they got someone they can trust. And Very important thing. Right. Because you can't really just talk to anyone about yeah. what you did with your finances. Right. And I speak from personal experience, and I'm not afraid to tell people now. At the time, I was very embarrassed. Uh, my daughter is t- 25. She was just a, a few months old when my car got repoed. And I remember calling the police after working 12 hours 
they're reporting my stolen car, and they're like, Mr. Shapiro? I'm like, yeah, did you find my car already? Well, you better call your bank. They probably know where it is. And it just, it's just, just, you know. Sinking feeling. Just my throat uh, just dropped into the pit of my stomach, kind of feeling, you know. And then I had to have my assistant drive me home to Corona from Riverside, which is a very long half-hour drive with just the shame of losing my car, but also knowing that now life just got a whole lot more, uh, a, lot, a lot worse. Because now not only do I not have the car that I had missed the payments on, but now I got to come up with a new way to buy a new car because I can't go to work without a car 30 miles away. Very painful. So now when someone tells me, oh, you know, I, I had a car repossessed, it's still on my credit, and I don't know why they say I owe so much. Well, I know exactly why. Because they made a profit when they sold you the car. And then when they took your car back, they didn't need to make a profit again. They just need to cover the tow bill and the storage bill. So when they sell it at auction, if someone just bids enough to pay those two things, they don't care about making a profit because whatever profit they don't get to keep, they have to apply it to your loan. That's not their problem. So they don't, you know, there's no bidding war mm. on your repoed car, no matter what you think it's worth. The same with the house. I had a mortgage broker and, and a realtor who I was really close to and uh, had shared that they could fix this space. And my wife had lost her very high income job. And you know, we went through all the hoops that you had to go through to modify a loan. And I remember getting the mail one day, it was April 5th. And it said, we're sorry, you went through your trial modification, whatever, you didn't qualify for the modification, the federal modification. So we'll resume foreclosure proceedings. Now, again, this was many years ago. Right, right. But I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a oh, Friday yeah. night. That'll leave a mark. And I did, I did not sleep that night because I knew the foreclosure date was supposed to be April 6th. This is April 5th. Oh, wow. So I don't know how that works. That wasn't my lane, right? April 6th, I get another letter, right? Again, two days in a row, I'm the first one in the mailbox. Not a thing normally, but fortunately for my family, it was. And that letter says, well, we have our own guidelines. Congratulations. We'll offer you our modifications where you can spend almost half of your income a month on your house payment. Oh, man. Uh, so, <laughs> Congratulations. Right. Congratulations. <laughs> if you're willing to spend all the money you make on, uh, on a house payment, then we can fix this. And even that, six months later... It, it, so that's April 6th. Now, September, I get the paperwork that you finally met all the conditions. You have five days to sign this promissory note and this modification. And it's all the payments that we let you skip over the last, you know, whatever number of months. It must have been 12 because it's about 24 grand. And we give you half a percent off your interest. Oh, by the way, we added uh, 10 more years to your mortgage, so you got $200 a month break. If the paperwork's not back in five days, we resume foreclosure proceedings. So you, so now you're over a barrel. Like you, there's yeah. no way you can start a new refi right. when you've already been in a modification, and nobody else will help you except your bank, because they told you. Then now it's illegal. But then, they told me, when I came in to make that payment, after 13 months of struggling to make a payment, so well you haven't missed. You haven't even been 30 days late. You know, they, they, they took my payment March 30th. They said, come back after two or three months after you've been late, and then we can see what programs you qualify for. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore, but they were very clear. They accepted my March 1st payment 29 days late, and they knew I couldn't come back on April 1st and make another payment. And they didn't give me back that money. Mm. And then when I came back and I saw what they were offering, I went to other banks. I knew plenty of people around town. Sorry, man. You you just you were just late on your mortgage two months in a row. We can't help you now. Mm -hmm. Very painful lesson, man. Very painful. So those are the lessons that you know. It's tuition, and and they are uh, very expensive. <laughs> it's a very expensive right. tuition, but that will stick with you. Right. So I've learned a really tough lesson on my house. On my, on my car and on the student loans, the three major things most people spend money on. So I really have, like you, I have a perspective beyond what most people would expect on each of those areas. So I know exactly how you <laughs> feel. 
not knowing how you're going to pay for those things. Yep. And even the credit. Yeah. You know. Well, I have. So I had a repossession. I so similar. I I'm not, I won't get into all of all of my dirt, but yeah, repossession, uh, foreclosure, bankruptcy, um, everything that could possibly happen. Well, that repo unbeknownst to me so they sold it you know they they repoed it the bank sold it i think i had financed the car for like thirty two thousand. they sold it for twelve thousand. it was a nineteen thousand dollar deficit well i'd never heard from them this was in 2007 a long time ago right mm -hmm. 2008 maybe and right. During didn't that low period in real estate and financing. Yep. And right before it was like the precursor of, of yes. all of those things starting to happen. And what ended up happening is I thought they just wrote it off. Until four years later, I found out that my bank got hit for twenty nine thousand. Well I only had three hundred bucks in the in the bank. So all of my $300 was gone. And I said, what is this? And they're like, you need to call, here's the legal department. I call the legal department, I'm like, what? And then they said, well, yeah, Mr. Carlisle, there was a default judgment that some company has, and I guess there was, you know, and so the bank had hired a law firm to come after me that, mm -hmm. that long later. Um, now they did some shady practices on how they got the default judgment because I didn't even know until they hit my account. Right. And it's you're not, not like supposed to do that. Right. You never left town. So yeah. it's not like you weren't hard you weren't hard to find. <laughs> yeah. Well, they chose not to find you. Yeah. And and then what ended up happening is for the next I literally just got that taken care of about a year ago. A little less than a year ago. And it followed me and that Nineteen thousand went to twenty nine thousand, mm -hmm. ended up getting up to sixty thousand dollars. Wow! And I'm trying to deal with them now. the The company was a very arrogant, like condescending type of a right. of a you know that's who who worked there. And so when I tried to call, like, hey, I need to do this. I want to buy a house. I want to do this. And they're like. <laughs> Mr. Carlisle, you know, we hope you have a tremendous amount of success because, you know, the more success you have, the more chances we have to get our money back. And they did not want to, you know, do anything fair in my mind. They're like, right. no, we're going to stick it to you because we got the golden ticket. Right. You got right. the golden ticket. You doesn't matter. We're going to get this right. from you. They got 10 years to collect on that. Yeah. Well, then they, think then they, they refiled chance, it, though. Then they, they renew it. Yeah. They can they, renew it twice. You could have a debt for 30 years in California even with a four-year statute of limitations because they get that lawsuit and you didn't properly defend it the first time, didn't even know about it. They, Yeah, they got a long time. They can wait it out. What a horrible situation. Right. How right. many people are in that situation now? I'm sure there's a decent amount. Yeah, there's a lot of people in that position. Even, even I mean, that's. I just wrote an article about this for, uh, for the Chamber of Commerce. There, there's been a lot of relief for different phases of being in a in a in a in a health crisis that we've been experiencing for the last uh, you know this year last and the relief does not extend to most private banking uh, issues you may have there's no relief for private student loans there's no relief for lawsuits except you couldn't go to court but they found a way around that with you know different ways that you can meet there is no relief on your credit report. There is, a, I'd say, that's the piece that is that is getting ready to explode. Is the people who didn't meet one of these qualifications for assistance? They paid their rent every month. They skipped on some other bill, right? If you if you got time off from your rent. Yeah, there's some talk about forgiving all that money. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't take time off from your rent, you didn't have that extra money to apply maybe to pay down all your credit card bills. So there's no relief on the credit card bills. You got maybe a couple months off if you asked for it. If you didn't yep. ask for it, you got you just got dinged as a late and that'll haunt you until we fix it. Um, there's no... So you, so you have the, the car that, uh, you know, now people are paying a whole lot more for a car because... Last year, people didn't have to drive their car for many months. And so a lot of people got rid of those cars. They got rid of the car payment, got rid of the car. 
now all of a sudden people are seeing things have reopened and they got to get to work, you got to buy a car, used car prices are up over 40% in the first half of this year. Man. So there are a lot of ways that you can really still get in trouble. And the only relief is you got a little bit of time off from your student loans. Not all of them. About 25% of people are still in default, just waiting for that payment to resume. And they'll, they'll be going straight to wage garnishment or maybe taking their tax a refund or going to the bank account like they did on that lawsuit and just take the money because they know where your bank is. And, um, yeah, so there, there, there's a lot of pieces that that are under the radar right now that as as the economy improves, we're going to find out that people are still really needing help. And it's embarrassing to ask for help. Absolutely. Yeah. Nobody wants to say I made a mistake or I am not as successful as I like people to think, <laughs> right? Right. That, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's reality. Nobody likes to talk about that. But, you know... It is liberating when somebody can be, but it's good for people like you because you are confidential. You somebody can say something and you will not you will not say a damn word to anybody right. unless like you said, and and I have seen that because I hired you for my credit stuff. Now, I'm like a open book. I don't care because I make mistakes and I'll be the first person to let everybody know, hey, don't do that. There's a bump in the road. I did it because I was dumb and I was looking this way and I should have been looking that but it is what it is, regardless if you know that or not. And if right. you know, and if you judge me, well, that's your problem, not mine. So, that's right. so, but anyway, I know from hiring you that that is the case that you are confidential, that you don't mention things. And you know, we've seen each other in public, and you're, you right. know, and again, it's cool. I appreciate that. I don't care. Right. A lot of people do care, and right. that is something that is an accolade that I will give you, and I will say that because it is true. And so. Right. I remember you introduced me to, to someone I had never met in person over the phone, and I was helping them uh, over the phone. We never had any reason to meet. They, were, they had business in town, and, and you introduced me at a, at a public place, and I just took note of the name but said nothing about how I knew the name, and I'm sure that that person knew my name and probably where my name was from, but we didn't speak of it because it wasn't the right place. and. Again, it, it's never my place to bring it up, how we know each other right. offline. Um, I tell people when they call in or uh, when they get referred, I said, this is a no judgment zone. We're not, you know, you you can be embarrassed over the situation. It's, it's natural, but we're not going to judge you for it right. because we've all experienced it. We know that's how we know how to fix these things. Yes. Is we've experienced it. And, and the latest thing we have now is we've got people... You know, they didn't pay their timeshare bill last year, so now, you know, they're facing foreclosure on something that they they were paying more maintenance fees than they ever spent on vacation before. Yes. And so we're help, helping people with that. And, and even IRS bills, which has given people some time off with the pandemic, but not relief from their taxes. So. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's great. Um, I know we did get into a lot of other topics that we weren't necessarily but this is why I like doing what I do because it really allows me to kind of dig into spaces that I see where other people I think would benefit of knowing and that's why I ask the questions that I do but the the concept of this podcast is called the move podcast and it's to talk to people that have overcome some type of adversity and they're doing things to help better society. Well, you fit into that box in several places. That's why I wanted you to, to sit down with me. But one of the things when we talked about, I told you what this podcast was about, you had a couple of different stories and I, and I know that you're writing a book. Can you tell me a little bit about that book? Sure. So this book is about overcoming the odds, uh, conquering something that in similar circumstances other people have not survived literally something that could have killed me and there's and, and I'm up to almost 30 chapters of all the different ways I have conquered something that could have been deadly and not everything has been overcome through divine intervention but there are some things that there is no other explanation uh, that, and if, you, that you, if you didn't believe before you have to believe uh, and I'll give you two examples. 
I've documented twice that I fell asleep while driving a long time ago. Uh, one time I woke up, I was about 18 years old, 17 maybe, and I woke up, I've got the car on cruise control, going 55, uphill, the Zion National Park area, Utah, around midnight because there's nice moon, and I'm about to hit a semi, which is definitely not going uphill at 55 miles an hour. And just whatever caused me to wake up, number one. Number two, to, to get out of the way with and, and not overcorrect and fly off the mountain. And get back in my lane and, you know, correct that, that error. Clean that up was, your underwear later. <laughs> so uh, the second time that I fell asleep, that I documented while driving, uh, I was working for a newspaper and somebody didn't show up and I was having to deliver the, the newspapers. I had a car full of, you know, hundreds of newspapers. And I'm driving from the Paris Airport area, Riverside County, through Quail Valley to Canyon Lake, a very nice area, not far from Corona. And I, there's a, there's a 90 degree turn, there's a sign that says 15 mile an hour. I didn't, I didn't negotiate that turn. I woke up airborne. So, sign, guard rail, neither of those things stopped me. I literally land in a puff of smoke. I'm sure the car's on fire, so I turned the car off. I'm not really sure what to do. I'm trying to process this while still, now I'm fully awake. So, I, I roll down the windows. I see the smoke is subsiding. It turns out it's dust. So thank goodness, number one. Number two, I take out my spotlight, because I have a spotlight to see the addresses on the curbs in the middle of the night. And I look around, I see I'm in a field. Um, I see an opening in the, in the, up above, you know, 30 feet or however high up the, the edge of this cliff was. And uh, so I, st I start the car up again, it starts. I start to move the car, which I, again, miraculously didn't pop all four tires landing so far down and turn the car, navigate, get out of the field. I'm able to go up this dirt hill, get out on the road. I deliver the newspapers. I go wash the car and I take it to the company. Uh, it was a company car at the time. And I said, look, can you check out the car? I don't know what's wrong with it. And didn't tell them what to look for. And <laughs> they, you know, they gave me a loaner car. I come back the next day. I said, well, we changed the oil for you because we know you're driving almost 3,000 miles a month anyway. We can't find anything wrong with the car. And, I mean, there's nothing. Not a bent frame. Not a, you know, gray paint on the bumper from going through the guardrail. Wow. I don't know how, but I know that there is a higher power that allowed me to live through it that. It was not your time to go. Right. Yeah. And, I, and again, I remember like it was yesterday, but this is, you know almost 20 years ago. Uh, other feats of survival, not so heavenly inspired. I, mean, I remember at 16 driving down to uh, Tijuana with uh, my best friend in high school. And you know, we're driving back and we, we bought one piece of contraband. It was an M80, mm -hmm. little quarter stick of dynamite firecracker. And we're getting near the border. I'm like, oh, man, what if they search the car, right? I mean, at 16, I don't know any better. So I get the inspiration, you know, let me, uh, you know, I got this uh, new car with a locking uh, uh, door on my, on my, on my gas. Uh, uh, oh, no. You know, so, I, so I just, I open up the locking gas uh, the door, you know, not the, not the gas cap. You know, I stick it in there. Of course, we got through, you know, the border. And we get out the other side, and I, I pull the piece of uh, M80 dynamite out, firecracker. And that's when I realized how stupid <laughs> that move was. <laughs> right. right? Like, I mean, if, if someone was just patrolling, you know, just come up to talk to me, and a guard smoking a cigarette, we could all be gone. So the, those are, are the kinds of things. Uh, some of my story is much more detailed. You know, surviving... Uh, Morbid obesity. I told you a little bit about my, my big loser contest. 
By the way, it, it, I was inspired by that TV show of a similar name. And while I never went on the show, I did film a clip with one of the trainers at a, a, an event where I was marketing uh, some weight loss products. And uh, she was there and asked me to do a demonstration with her on, on camera. And uh, another time here in town with, uh, with an organization you'll be familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, Crossroads Church, we had a, an event there for um, the World uh, Conference. World Kindness Youth Conference. Right. And so Shirley asked me if I would you know, lecture the kids about healthy eating habits. And uh, and I put on a little expo for some of my health partners that I had around town that were helping people in that arena. Just come, have a booth, talk to people about what you do, and you know, maybe we get some business out of it, and not, you know, maybe the kids and their parents mostly would be inspired. I was told the kids, you, you, as a fourth grader, don't need to be on a diet. But you hear that word in your household, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what it means and why it's important to not to take that personally, no matter what someone's telling you. Hmm. So after the expo, you know, I get called up on stage, and I'm being recognized on that stage with their feature speaker, which was one of the people who had been bullied, John gained Pritikin. all this weight. Yeah. Uh, actually, it was, it was before that year, because oh. it was one of the fellows who had gone on Biggest Loser as a 21-year-old. Oh. Like oh, got it. Who okay. had a huge amount of weight. But he, he told us, he said, I used to go home from school after getting bullied, and I would literally be eating my bullies. I would just eat everything uh, wow. because of I was bullied. And he, it was like he was eating the bullying. And he got very large, over 400 pounds, and very, very large. But he came on stage, and he called me up before he gave his talk. And... And uh, I got recognized for Very the work cool. I was doing in that space, which was pretty pretty cool to get a you know congressional certification and from the Senate and everyone else about the work. Um, and but even even as much knowledge as I gained through my weight loss experience, it's not about knowledge alone. Because if it was, all of us would be rich and skinny. So it's not about the knowledge. It's about how you apply it and what else is going on internally that might keep you from doing what you already know needs to be done and what is what is the obstacle that you have to overcome to be inspired enough to do the work. You know, now there's medical reasons why you might be overweight and there's other things that might prevent you from exercising. Uh, so again, not just about the knowledge. I think that so many people, I think everybody can relate to that. I, going through college, my favorite poem that I memorized and has never left me was from Shakespeare. It's called The Expense of Spirit. Now, it's talking about man's pursuit of the other, spe of, you know, of the male to the female, you know, to, to get... They get laid, basically. Excuse my French. But, um, <laughs> so the whole thing talks about, you know, before, it's this, like, this passion, and it has all this potential, and it's good, and it's, but on the back end, it'll make you lie, cheat, steal, and hurt, and do things that you're not normally, you know, to do. And the last part of it says, all men know, yet none know well to shun the heaven that lead men to this hell. We all know what we should not do, but we don't know well enough not to do it. So we do things that make us regret, you know? And so everything, you know, as far as being a successful business person, always comes down, in my opinion, the, one of the biggest things is accountability and discipline. And I am personally struggling with that because I have my you know, the, the loans and then I have the real estate and then I have the podcasting and then I have the videography and doing different things. And it's like, all right, well, where should I spend my time? And then sometimes I don't do what I'm supposed to do. And then it's like, okay, well, I got that, that, that. And then it's like, and then I'm just going in a circle, standing in the same place. And so 
so it's very important to have people that can help you take one step forward, right. one step forward, and be accountable. Being accountable is important, and it it it, it there, there's two things this calls to mind. So one is, in my office, everybody is asked to read a a daily column about habits, and every day we read about about rich, rich habits versus poor habits, and every now and then you read. Uh, and this author's very inspiring. He did a study of, of both uh, wealthy and poor people. And for years, he's written about what he learned from the, just a few hundred people. But how different your habits are when you're successful versus when you're struggling. Yeah. And uh, his name is Tom Cordley. And it, uh, it's, again, it's... It, for some people, it may be about that knowledge. Like if you change this habit, and he tells you about ways that he's changed habits, which is very easy to follow if you're inspired to follow the habit, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're not willing to change the habit, then it doesn't matter if you know what you have to do or not, right? Yeah. The accountability side, for me, I have a very good example of that. So one of my things that I had to overcome was I had uh, been, been after I got in shape, I started walking and then running. Um, and the walking was just a mile a day. And then every Friday I'd see those kids going to the elementary school and they'd have their t-shirt on for the 100 mile club. <laughs> and so then I had a, a bigger in incentive right now, I had to get to the 100 miles because they could do it, I could probably do it too. and. Then, as I continued to do that, other people saw me walking, and I one in particular, my daughter's best friend in elementary school, she asked me if she could walk with me, and I'm like, sure. You know, she's like, well, I'll park my car, I have to drop my kid off, and we'll walk, and then eventually we got up to 5K, and then further, and you know, one day my, my pharmacist said, she goes, you know, you've lost a lot of weight. You know, why don't you run a half marathon with me? And I, and I just laughed my head off. I thought it was the funniest <laughs> thing I'd ever heard of. <laughs> I was 25 pounds into my first 50 pound weight loss, but after 50 pounds, I'm like, you know what? Maybe you're right. I'll do the half marathon with you. And I started running, and I started practicing, and, and eventually, I was able to do that half marathon. It was uh, oh, 2008, wow. 2009. And then you know, you get back from the half marathon, and people say, well, you do a half marathon, maybe you should do a marathon, right? So I joined this walking club with another good, good friend who who wanted to hold me accountable. She ultimately became a fellow trainer with me at, at UFC Gym when UFC first opened in town. Again, the oldest man and woman trainer, right, was me and my trainer uh, at this gym. And so she got me inspired to, to start working towards a marathon. And then I'd finished uh, three marathons. And, and I did that in 90 days, which is not really, oh, wow. um, it's not really a thing. Right, like like both her husband, my other trainer, and uh, several others were like, "You're nuts! Like you can't do, you know, like you're gonna <laughs> be in a fog." What a compliment! <laughs> right. So then this fellow, Ed, tells me he goes, "You should try an ultra marathon." Go, What's that? The marathon was it. He goes, "Well, uh, an ultra marathon is anything over uh, 50k, 31 miles or more." And a little, he had just run his first ultra marathon. He didn't tell me that part, right? But he had just run for 24 hours and had done maybe 100 miles. And so now for the next six months, I'm training for ultra marathons. And I must have run at least 20 marathons that year practicing Whoa. for an ultra marathon. Wow. Okay. And some of the practice obviously doesn't count as a marathon because you have no official race time. And uh, so I run with him. Uh, I tell him about this ultra marathon that the Hunter Mile Club was doing in town, a 24 hour race at a school here in Corona Norco. And he says, You know, that's perfect because I need to get 100 miles in to, 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 to match the world record. And so he's now running for 24 hours. Well, I've done the same 24 hours, I, I ran two marathons in the same time it took him to run four marathons. Whoa. He tells me, you know what, I just uh, just tied the world record unofficially. 
And I said, well, we've got the, the Los Angeles Marathon tomorrow. Like, what are you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to go get some rest, and I'm going to go down there about 2 in the morning, and I'm going to park at the end, and I'm going to run to the start line. I said, wait a minute. You're going to park at the end. You're going to you're gonna run 26 miles before the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, he's known as Ed the Jester. Is it literally, I mean, it's pretty funny, but he's now the world record holder for the most ultra marathons. Um, but at the time, he had he had matched the world record that a woman here in Corona sat Yolanda Holder, and Yolanda runs to fight to to pr promote fighting obesity and to, and to fight and to stay active to to help people prevent and and manage their diabetes, which which took someone very close to her, and so she was inspired to mm. to do that. So the next year, there's an ultra marathon. She joins the ultra marathon, and I catch up to her briefly. She's known as the Walking Diva, and I most when I say I run, it's mainly a very fast walk. And I said, "Hey, I was with Ed when he tied your world record." She goes, uh, "Excuse me, I'm still the world record holder for the most marathons run by a woman." Ah, you know, <laughs> he can never so take sorry. that one. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> Did not mean to offend, but it was a it was a very natural reaction. It was very true. There's a point to this. Now I'm I'm a couple years into these ultra marathons, and I'm practicing with the next faster group at my running club in in Riverside. And I fell a little bit behind. It was my first day running this this pace. And I said, "You guys go ahead. I'll catch up. I'm gonna use the little outhouse, whatever." And I end up passing these kids, one's dragging his bike and the other one's, you know, walking with him. And just after I passed them, I saw these four dogs loose, two of them chased after me, one of them, the pit bull, got a hold of my left leg and would not let go. Oh, and, wow. And uh, that was a really, really tough moment because, you know, I like animals, don't like them biting me. <laughs> and, Especially uh, a mean looking pit bull. That that right. will not only hurt but instill oh, some it, fear, I can yeah, imagine. Yeah, it hurt it hurt bad. And uh once I shook that dog loose, I knew the other dog was trying to take me down with the other leg and I wasn't gonna, you know, mess up this money maker. You know? <laughs> so I'm too pretty. Right? <laughs> um so the first thing I did was to turn around to see if the kids were okay and the dogs were gone and uh you know, the fire department came, and the ambulance, and the police, and uh, someone recognized my orange shirt, and they picked me up to take me back to my car. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I think I recognize those dogs, you know, pulling here. And the police hadn't arrived yet. So, uh, you know, I look, yeah, those, those definitely the dogs that chase me. And uh, so the police come, I wave them down, I'm still at this house, they come up. The guy goes up, I'm ringing the bell, nobody's answering, there's nobody home. So I, I realized I dropped my rag when I got out to show the cop where we were. And so I get up, pick up my bloody rag for my for my leg, and uh, I say, hey, when, when you got here, there were three dogs behind the fence. Uh, there were four dogs, now there's only three. So he pulls out his gun, says, stay behind me. We both start backing up. Animal control pulls up. Two of the dogs go to her. She's only got two lassos, so that's so she's busy. The other dog that tried to get me ran back under the fence, but the pit bulls just stand there and just stare off with the cop. And all of a sudden, the, the pit bull just no, no provocation, just lunged at the cop. He shot it dead. Oh man! Fell down. And so now I've been traumatized by getting bit. I refused the ambulance. I'm going to have someone drive me to the hospital instead. And now I got the dead dog in front of me that, oh, man. you know, if I made a wrong move, I might have been between the cop and the dog, you know. So it was a very, again, it, now I've survived twice this day, <laughs> something. <laughs> and and I tried to put it behind me. And for two years, I'm still, you know, once I recover, I got back into ultra marathons as best I could. Not, not at the speed I was running that day. The... Uh, Two years to the day, the gal, my, my best, one of my best friends of all time, Lisa, is 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 riding the bike with me while I'm running, practicing for another ultra marathon. And uh, she had some personal event happen; she had to leave. I said, "Well, go. You got the bike. You know, I'm going to be out here for six hours. You'll you'll, fi you'll find me. You know the path. You'll catch up." 
As soon as she leaves, I realize, you know, I'm picking up the next biggest stick, next biggest stick. I'm running behind the Corona Airport with like bushes on one side, cars on the other side. And I got my pepper spray in one hand with oh, a man. big stick <laughs> and my phone ready to dial 911. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm two years later. I'm still Scared. traumatized. PTSD. I can't run by myself. So the point is that now I can't, I don't run by myself. I don't go exercise by myself. I could psychologically. I know I could overcome that, but I, I have no, I used to go out sometimes run 25 miles by myself down to the beach. Wow. So accountability is a very important factor for me because if I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to ask someone to go with me or, or, you know, if I get invited to the gym, let's invite someone else. I was trying to have three people because, you know, one person might flake out on you, but two people aren't going to flake out the same day. And, uh, and that's what I'm finding sense. with the accountability is if you're just by yourself, right? So like someone calls up, they need help. I was asking them, is there someone else that's going to do the, you know, the credit education with you? Because if, if you got someone else working it with you, you might even do all the work for them or vice versa, especially if husband, wife or a significant other. But if you got two people working on this, you're going to hold each other accountable. If it's just one, yeah, you know, you might drop the ball. My people might call you every month, try to help you. But if you're not inspired to do the work, you may not hit finish the snooze button. Right. Hit the snooze button. Hit the and just never gets done. Right. By the way, I don't use the snooze button. That's good. I <laughs> wish I could say that. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, again, just probably from some talk show, like you're not getting any extra sleep. Those, those nine minutes, you're not getting back into deep sleep, seven minutes or 30 minutes, whatever it is. All you're doing is, is, is losing more time in the sleep you could have had. So yeah. instead, just set the alarm for the time you have to get up and then just get up there. Just roll because, out of bed. Because then at least you got the extra maybe half hour of sleep that you really needed. And then you, when the alarm goes off, you, ha you know you have no choice. So you just got to hit the ground running. And my goal is to get up before the snooze button goes off. So, yeah, those the being bit, chased by dogs, being bit by dogs, watching a dog get shot. Uh, that was my third time getting bit by a dog. So it... Yeah, that that yeah. leaves a mark. Yes. So the, I now I was Literally. laughing. I was laughing <laughs> when you were saying that, and I was not trying to be an a hole, but uh, but it just brought back a a moment in my life <clears throat> where I was in a similar situation. I was in the army. We had just gone. Thank you to for your a, service. Well, right. yeah, of course you it was. It. You know, th oh, well, thank you for thanking me. Thank you. But um, there was. So we were out in a, in a big training. It was here in California, as a matter of fact. Uh, they call it NTC. And you have op four and you have, and you're the good guys. And then you go out and you do, you're out in the desert and you're okay. just training to go to like Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq or wherever. And you're literally, you have a mission and you're, it's just like you're in war, but everything's laser tag, right? So even the tanks have lasers and they can shoot and it's, it's like a big laser tag. Okay. Well, at two o'clock in the morning, I was a driver. I was a driver of one of these things. And, and when you're out in the desert and you guys stop, you all have strategic locations and you know, you have in each platoon, there are numbered tanks. They were Bradley's, but you know, tanks, Bradley's, if you know, but, but Bradley's, I didn't know that tanks weren't generic. Yeah. So well, so we were with a tanker battalion. Uh, a, a tanker platoon we would be like um, and they would actually have the M1 Abram tanks and then we were the Bradleys so we were the eyes and ears we were cavalry scouts okay. eyes and ears of the army and we would go sneak and peek and then once we basically identified a location then the big guns we call in the tanks and the okay. tanks come in and blow shit up so <laughs> uh, so anyway I it's two o'clock in the morning and there was an ice um, the ice got here, but so, th so they call, okay, have your drivers go get the ice. I'm like tired. It, mm. it was been, you know, it was, it was a rough situation. And I'm like, ah, damn it. I got to go. Okay, fine. Now, when you leave, you're supposed to be all buttoned up, meaning you're supposed to have your Kevlar on. You're supposed to be buttoned up your weapon, everything like you don't get caught right. snoozing. Right. Well, 
I was like, I know where I'm going. I'm just gonna go get the ice real fast and come back before anybody catches me. I'm just gonna go sneak in and come back out real fast. So I, d I left my weapon. I, I, you know, I left my, I left everything. I'm just gonna go. Well, I'm, I'm hurrying out there. And then I realized like, I'm walking a little farther than I should be walking. Like I should have, I should have, and I'm like, well, right. well this ain't cool. Right so then I turn around 180 degrees. I better go back. And I'm walking faster because I got to get back. And now I'm not dressed out and I'm like, oh, oh crap, I'm going to get in trouble. I need to. I, and I keep walking and I keep walking some more. And then literally I'm lost. I reached the determination. I am lost. And so I'm looking around and now I'm scared. And I thought the coyotes are going to get me. So I reached down and I picked up a big rock two actual big rocks and I was like walking going, ah shit. So, so when you were telling me that story, that's like, I went, I had a flashback there right. and I was scared. And then what ended up happening is way off in the distance, I saw a little red light and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I walked this far. <sighs> okay. Beeline. I'm, I can see it. I'm headed for that red light. Well, <laughs> so the the platoon sergeant was looking for me everybody was looking for me because i was gone and they realized it and and um and it was a tanker platoon that i had found that i it was like six miles away from us wow. that and that's where I, I ended up and then he picked me up and dropped me off of my platoon sergeant talk about ashamed and embarrassed and everything right. else and you know i was so they call they call it um ate the fuck up is is the the proper ter military terminology meaning that i was my stuff was not my poop was not in a in a scoop or whatever you want to call it right. um my poop was not in a group and so very embarrassing but but the platoon sergeant because he saw how in disarray and how that he didn't get me in you know i didn't get in a lot of trouble he just laughed his ass off which was even worse i would have rather right. gotten in trouble right but it was so embarrassing so but yes that when you're in that situation and and the the fear is real right so and you actually had it from an experience which is worse than me it was just me thinking of right, things thinking that could happen it. right but you had yeah, actual... my fear was because i had the experience already and i knew better and i and i had actually train people the following week I came back I said you know last week before we started running at five or six in the morning somebody said hey I almost got bit by a pit bull in my neighborhood you know be careful out there but that's all he told us and like that was not enough to equip me with how to be careful out there oh man so I came back with pepper spray and with uh, you know stun guns and with uh, with a, uh, a former police officer uh, now defense expert self-protection expert uh, with me to talk about ways that you can defend yourself and, and you know what things you can do and I researched you know what do you do about dog attacks and all the different things I even brought a, a sword I had just for fun <laughs> uh, I am prepared <laughs> yeah oh and, man uh, so that's a week after the dog attack August 12th 2012 and the following week so I'm up at five in the morning to go talk to the people. I wasn't in any shape to run. I couldn't even barely walk. You know, the doc said, you're not going to be running for two months. So I went to drop out of my ultra marathon because it was two months away. And I knew if I can't train, I can't run it. Uh, of course, they didn't believe I was going to drop out. They actually kept my spot. And so I ended up walking that ultra marathon as far as I could go. But point is that the following week, you know, I, I had an errand to run in the evening and my daughter's with me and, uh, you know, we go to, to deal with this issue and she goes, hey, Dad, you seem a little tired. Do you want me to drive home? I said, yeah, here's the keys of the van. We get on the freeway, 91 McKinley, and we're heading back towards the center of Corona. And just before we get to the 15th freeway, I get this feeling. I said, uh, move over, move over now. And... Unlike my daughter, typically would question things, <laughs> she immediately moved over. And the moment she moved in the next lane, the truck in front of us lost its whole load of furniture, which would have wiped us out. Oh, wow. And uh, you know, we got home, and you know, she wrote about it, and 
um, my niece said, uh, you know, that isn't like you, Stephanie, to listen, you know, right <laughs> away, that whatever your dad might have told you, but, you know, saved our life. That's when I decided to start writing this book. It was a long time ago, but it was because I had now two weeks time and basically survived three different ways. Uh, something that anyone else might, might have died in. Um, and, and since then, I've, I've added a number of things to that story. I was inspired to write about this actually at a Bible study. There was a pastor there. And you know, you notice I'm wearing a yarmulke today. This is in honor of my mom who passed away recently. Remind me that I'm in this period that uh, Jews mourn um, a certain amount for seven days, and then for 30 days, a, a different level of, of uh, compliance, we'll say, and, and recognition of that passing. And then you don't visit that grave for, for uh, up to a year afterward until the unveiling of the grave marker. So like you move on with your life. Uh, so you don't see a lot of Jews at Bible study. It's not; a, it's a Christian thing. Uh, but a couple of very uh, prominent uh, Christian men in town, good men, had invited me and another good uh, Jewish friend to these Bible studies, and I was very inspired. And one guest pastor one day was telling us a story about how he had survived something that could have killed him, and you either had to believe that that he had experienced a miracle and received divine intervention or he was just a flat out liar because it couldn't be anything in between right. what he survived. But he said, he said, I tell you what I lived through, what I overcame because I want you to think about what has God brought you through. What have you overcome? What are you going to do with this? You know, think about it. Think about what have you been able to overcome because God was there for you. And so I took out my little pocket uh, uh, notebook, little computer, started typing up a list of about a dozen ways that I'd survived something that could have killed me. And eventually had um, developed that list into what will now be this book. And I have uh, quite a bit left to, to write about the details. The one uh, chapter that's most developed, um, turns out my mother also had developed that chapter in her own story, because our stories overlap. When I was in Israel for her, um, s to see her uh, final days, and, uh, and, 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 and then for her funeral and so forth, one of the things we found in her papers in her apartment was the story about her perspective of what she went through to get me and my twin brother back from Argentina when my dad took us there for a, during a custody battle. And tell people, we were the first internationally publicized case of child stealing. And there were articles written about us all over the world in the 1970s. And in Argentina, when they'd write about us, they'd call us Los Mellizos de Oro, the twins of gold, the golden twins. Because no, nobody spends this amount of time or money fighting custody battles across international lines. A dad knew, because he married him, uh, my stepmother was from Argentina, he knew that the laws would not um, require um, him to, to honor the, the U.S. laws that Argentina didn't recognize, didn't have an extradition treaty with the states in the 1970s. And uh, so he knew he was pretty safe. And while we were there, um, used to have these meetings with important people in town. Maybe that's where I got, you know, the desire to to be friends with important people in town. I don't know, but he certainly had uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, the chief of police. These people would come every week and meet at the house. And one day I asked him. I said, "What? What's all with all the secret meetings, Dad?" We were eight or nine years old. He said, "Well, uh, you know, go look in my bedroom. There's a suitcase under the bed." You know, so open up the suitcase. My brother pulls out an article in English. I pull one out in Spanish. It's got our third grade pictures in it. And it's talking about how we've been kidnapped. And uh, so he's making plans for when we get found. Um, the day that they came to find us, chief of police was off. His assistant didn't know any better that we're 
you know, the Americans not to be messed with. Uh, so he goes to the neighbor's house. The neighbor, Cecilia, says, ah, yes, the Americans, yes, they used to live over here, but they just moved over across town or over by the cuckoo clock. It's a famous landmark in this town in Argentina, Carlos Paz. So she sends them on a wild goose chase. She runs over, of course, as soon as all the cops are gone. Says, "Hey, they, they, they're going to be back. They, you know, I sent them away, but they're, they know you're here." And so we go hide out in her house. And the police come back, and very pissed off. She's like, "You're not searching my house. Even, even in the 1970s, you couldn't just go into someone's house without a court order, even in Argentina." So they post a guard at the front door. Off to the capital they go to get a court order from the state. And my dad's smoking cigarette one after another after another, like three packs, just straight on smoke. And finally, he keeps looking at his watch. He says, okay, it's time. If they got to the Capitol as fast as they could go, bribed a judge, got the paperwork, and come back, they're going to be here anytime. We got to go. So hers is the last house before the mountain on this street that we're on. So we go out the backyard. We start scaling the backyard like a little farm type of a, of a backyard that grew growing corn or whatever, tall enough to hide. All of a sudden, a big car pulls up, like a Hummer type of vehicle, whatever they had in the 70s. All these guys with machine guns jump out and surround us, haul us off, right? So, uh, again, nobody got trigger happy, another chance to survive. They, they detained us in some kind of like a law library or something overnight, and next day, they go to court, judge orders us to go to this orphanage while they duke this out in court in Argentina because mom's got a court order from Los Angeles uh, court. She's got a police report from the LA County Sheriff. She's got a, a letter from the district attorney's office of LA um, demanding the return of these kids and uh, they, they're, they're not honoring that in Argentina. Well, we spent about nine months in that orphanage, first with the caretakers. Whoa. And how old were you at the time? Uh, nine years third old. Third grade. Okay. Yeah, we just finished. My son is dead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just finished third grade, and we were now starting fourth grade. In fact, I asked my dad two things he said. I, I was only concerned about two things. He said, one is, after we were gone about a month, I said, are we ever going to see Mom again? Because I knew it's, you know, two weeks is usually the time we got with him, even at eight, eight, eight years old. I said, yeah, yeah, you will. And he said, that was the end of my questioning. As long as I knew we were going to see her again, I was okay. And about a month after that, it's September. I'm like, Dad, aren't we supposed to be starting school pretty soon? He said, yeah, maybe we'll try school down here. Okay. <laughs> you know? So we, we had about less than three months of fourth grade in, in Argentina because we, we got found pretty quickly. And they were on the opposite hemisphere, so they were done with fourth grade then. We, we, we spent fifth grade in the orphanage. First with the caretakers, but we had um, two bodyguards that the state hired to make sure we didn't get uh, kidnapped again. Two that my dad hired to make sure my mom didn't bribe the state guards. Two that my mom hired to make sure my dad didn't bribe the state guards. So we had oh six bodyguards, God. even in the orphanage. But the first night that they sent us from being with the caretakers to being in the dorms with f literally 50 cots lined up, uh, and I remember we had Menudo, whatever Argentina's form of Menudo is, because as soon as I saw that dorm, I immediately went to the you know, group restroom and refunded my dinner. Uh, I was sick to my stomach, physically sick, knowing that we had two parents fighting over us, and and we're stuck here with 50 kids who have no parents to fight for now. And and I was pretty effed up. Yeah. You know, knowing no kidding. that we're stuck there, and we were stuck there for nine months. It oh. was a pretty miserable experience. Oh, it was a very regimented, you have to wake up at a certain time, eat at a certain time, go to bed at a certain time. I don't time. remember that part. I remember one thing about the food is that every Friday there was a churro vendor who came on the uh, grounds. And the Americans, me and my brother, were the only ones that could have credit with the churro vendor. He knew we'd pay him back. <laughs> and kids know every single time we've ever been to a public place where they've asked for a churro, they know they're going to get reminded and how much were churros when I was in Argentina? <laughs> a dollar American money bought me 20 churros. Wow. In the 1970s. Wow. So when you asked me to pay $3 for a churro, 
and not a foot long churro or a super long churro. <laughs> Understand? This is going to be an issue. <laughs> you're going to have a lecture. You know, I'll still buy you the churro, but you're going to hear the story again. So when you, so how did you guys finally come back? And then did they ever reconcile with each other? So uh, yes. So in in, in uh, I'll explain how they reconciled in a moment, but uh, in my mom's book. Uh, the, the portion she started, it says that she finally went to court and said, look, I'm going to give up battling for custody so the kids could get out of the orphanage. So that's how we ended up with her dad for two and a half years because she 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 lost that battle and eventually did get papers that said she's got custody to take us back to the United States. She got permission to take us on vacation. And so the day came when she was going to take us out of Argentina and we were kind of locked up in this in her lawyer's house because we we knew we were never going to see our dad again. We knew when we went on that vacation, she's going to do exactly to dad what dad did to her. And we didn't want to go. We're very popular. It was a very nice life, you know. You're living with the non-custodial parent, which is an important lesson for parents to understand. Like as when your kids are growing up, like the weekend parent is the fun parent. You have no choice in the matter. You got. You got no chores, you got no responsibilities, you got no homework. That's where you want to be. It doesn't matter how much work you put in during the week, getting the kids to school and back, getting them to every doctor's appointment, getting them to every assembly, making sure they got their homework done, make sure they do the chores. They'll remember that when they have kids. But while you're growing up, it is not appreciated. They want to be with the non-custodial parent, which is what we wanted to be. So we didn't want to leave there. And yeah, we had some responsibilities. We had a housekeeper, so we didn't have any, any chores. And we had a good life. So we tried to escape when we were on vacation. My dad's guard, guards caught us and brought us back because I thought we were having a nightmare. I had pried off the screen off the window of the house and, and said, you got to get us back to our dad. Oh, man. So we got we were locked up for a good two weeks. Finally, she said, "Okay, you know, we'll go on a field trip. We'd go to that uh, nightclub. It's made in the shape of a pyramid, like the one of the Egyptian pyramids. We go there. We take a little tour. Of course, it's during the day, but not open." So I said, "Okay, well, what are we doing now?" She said, "Oh, let's just wait here a minute." And I turned to my brother. I said, it, "It's going down. There, this is it. We're leaving Argentina today." And now we're at age eleven, but I know enough to know that. That there's no reason to be standing at a nightclub that's closed uh, beyond just walking around it. So we still got all our guards with us. Car pulls up. Two two big goons jump out. They're flashing legal papers at the guards, saying they're taking custody of us. Mom's guard is arguing with her, like, "Hey, my job's with the kids. It's that I don't answer to those guys. I don't care what the court papers say. I got a job to do. I'm staying with the kids." You know, another car pulls up, shoves us in the back of the car. Mom jumps in the front seat and we take off. And, and I could still picture, like it was yesterday, looking in the rear view mirror, it's a Mercedes, and looking in the rear view, or the rear window, turning back, looking at those six guards all lined up, no guns. Nobody pulled a gun. And until this Bible study, I had resented that they had not fought harder for us. But now that I was looking back on what I had overcome, I realized if any of those guys had pulled a gun, four big guys against six other guys, with two little boys in the middle, probably, yeah. probably saved my life, but they didn't pull a gun. So I could look back now with gratitude rather than, you know, Bitterness. resentment. Yeah. Same incident. Facts didn't change, but understanding better the other way it could have gone. Never thought about that, right? So in my mom's papers, I spent the last two days going through 38 years worth of papers that she had saved, that she had collected in Israel. And I have a file cabinet at home that I've never opened of hers with these court documents. But it, with her papers are the articles and all the letters she wrote back and forth between her mother and her two best friends her carbon copies of these letters about what's happening and what her her new husband has been doing to try to get the kids back and who they had to bribe and Whoa. who they had to talk to and which Bless. judge was on their Glory. side, which judge was on dad's side. The whole, all the evidence, right, including their letters 
you know, her letters to them, the ones that she didn't type with a carbon copy, they had saved and gave back to her when she came back to the States, which was not a thing. I don't even know why they would have thought to save that, but I have all that evidence now documenting exactly what transpired with her timeline, including a book, which was probably my most valuable find in this apartment of my mom's. I only had two days to clean it out, and I wasn't going to leave that for my sister to, to spend the next 30 days instead of mourning cleaning right. out an apartment. I said, we got two days, we're going to get this done. And this book is uh, my mom's testimony during the 1970s, going to Congress and testifying about why there should be an extradition treaty, why there should be international recognition of child custody laws in the United States. And, uh, you know, her senator and the congressman and all these, all this testimony went into this book, which is bound like a Library of Congress book, and it's titled The Child Stealing Act of 1979. It's got the our child pictures what? In, child Stealing Act of 1979. It's got our pictures in it from some of the news articles uh, that have been published by then. There's been others since then about our story. And uh, so that was probably the most valuable find, was her proof that she made a difference in the next kid's life, that you couldn't just take your kid out of the country anymore and not have the full weight of the U.S. government get your kids back. Yeah. Wow. That is just wow. What a story. Um, so you when you, now your brother, your relationship now, how, how is that? So with my twin brother, you know, we've had periods where we weren't uh, very close, you know, just distance-wise. We both uh, ended up starting college uh, before we turned 16. And, and my little sister, too, and my dad ended up having another uh, daughter um, after my mom. Um, so again, I've talked uh, about this in public before. You can take something that has been monumental in your life and you can either so you grew up with parents that weren't so great to you. Like you could carry that until you're old enough to move out or you could let it affect your whole life, right? And then you could pass it on to your children and make them miserable too, right? Or you could learn from it and be better than the last generation, right? And I've chosen to do that. You know, big differences between me and my brother, you know, I've got three kids. I had two nieces that lived with me for uh, quite a while, years. I had a foster daughter. He's had no kids, didn't ever want to get married. So we're very different, though we look very similar, right? Just different philosophies over life. Um, you asked me a question about um, if they ever reconciled. So oh, right. it was 1973, Valentine's Day, when we left Argentina. It was, And then we ended up, Mom ended up getting back here. We got back here to the States about seven days later. Whole another story on that trip. Mom, two days later, buys a motorhome. And we live in that motorhome for six months so that, you know, she could be, so dad couldn't find us because she was sure he was coming after us. But she had made sure that there was documented evidence that this guy had committed a felony and he wasn't coming back in the States legally without serving time. Um... I had a cousin who recently passed away, Dennis, um, and both the Orange County DA and the Orange County Sheriff spoke at his funeral. I was in the middle. I spoke in between the two of them. And they were both pretty emotional about how much this man meant to them personally and to what he had done for the county. I said, I want uh, Dennis's grandkids to know what he did for my family because when my dad, I didn't see my dad for five and a half years. So I went from finishing sixth grade in Argentina to I just graduated high school and finished my first year of college concurrently at, UC, at the University of California. And I said, well, when my dad wanted to come back to the States, he knew he was facing jail time. My cousin Dennis intervened. He was pretty influential even back then, a very wealthy, successful businessman. And he arranged for dad to come back without serving jail time and with, without having to go to prison and with being able to just come back on probation. And had it not been for him, I don't know how many years might have passed. But five years was a really long, long time. time. 
to go from sixth grade to finishing 12th grade and now in college without a dad. And a lot of kids go through that. I understand that. But if I could. Yeah, but this is the second bout because you just had your mom and then now you have no mom for those five years. And then now. For two and a half years. Or two and a half years. Just to visit. And then for five and a half years, no dad. Yeah, no, that's a. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and that's part of my motivation why the, the one niece stayed with me for many years. And uh, and I was determined to make sure she had a good good life because she, she wanted to live there at my house. And she didn't have a dad, uh, nor did her sister. We had a foster daughter for a few years, um, who, again, we've known her whole life. Again, a story in and of itself of how much battle it took to get her out of the foster care system and to be able to care for her. And I mentioned her earlier uh, when we talked about student loans and, and how she she didn't count, even though she was clearly a member of my household. And um, But there came a time where, where it was very difficult to have this child in my home. And each of the kids understood why I was not... Um, willing to just give up on the kid, even though she was very difficult. She, and she'll, she'll be the first to acknowledge that she was a difficult child, and she's almost college age now. But during the time she lived with me, I, I told her, I said, you, you may not appreciate this, you may not appreciate it until you have your own kids, but me being strict with you, you need to know it's because I love you, and it's, it, it, you don't like th this, you'll appreciate it later. And Others in the household were not um, um, beyond the time that her mother implied that it would take for her to get off uh, parole and get her child back. Um, like, like literally, she said, "Can you watch my kid for four and a half months?" And we ended up having her for four and a half years. <clears throat> um, Man. But each of my kids understood my position. They're like, "We understand. You live in an orphanage. No way you're throwing the kid away. We get it. You know." We get it. So, um, so that has shaped my desire to help, help people. I have a brother who I adopted. We adopted each other's families 25 years ago. We met at the first meeting of the Dad's Club at Prado View School. And the reason I moved to Corona was because of that school originally. When that school was being built, I went to a Chamber of Commerce meeting. I worked for the newspaper at the time. And the superintendent was talking about what they were putting in at that school. And um, I was so inspired, uh, we bought a house two weeks later and watched them finish building the school and the, and the house at the same time. And all three of my kids went to that school and all three of those, my nieces and the foster daughter, uh, she calls me Uncle Saul, so all three of my nieces went to that school as well. And... Uh, when my now 25 year old was first born and my older daughter was I think in fifth grade we uh, we, we had that first meeting the principal said hey I've heard of this concept and what do you guys think about having a dad's club and so John was was the first president of the dad's club and I was the first vice president of the dad's club and uh, and so we got very close and the idea was to keep kids um, with the dad involved, if you could get the dads involved at elementary level, maybe they'll keep the family unit together and they'll still be involved in the kid's life and, you know, maybe we prevent some marriages from breaking up and, you know, give the kid a better life, at, at least while they're in school. So, um, so over that time we, we, we became very close and, uh, uh, and, and even, I mean, even, you know, he, he has mourned the death of my mom. My mom helped him buy a house at one point in his life. She saw most of us buy a home at, at some point in our lives and, uh, or helped in some way or another. So, uh, so why do I mention that? Uh, this, 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 this brother, um, uh, and I, uh, started these dad's club all over town and, uh, throughout the state, they created a, a, a national nonprofit, which we eventually took to Florida, New York. We even flew to Indiana once and helped start a dad's club. There. Oh wow, that's cool! And again, just about trying to use my 
experience and his experience with divorce to help create a different generation of dads for the next generation of kids. So. Mm. How have you looked at any statistics from that as far as what you could measure as far as how how many dads were involved or how what kind of an impact you had? I'm just curious. So, you know, I, I belong to several organizations and I know of only one divorce in that original dad's club, which was John. He ended up getting remarried to a wonderful woman, like a sister to me now, Kat. But uh, he got divorced. I don't know of anyone else in that original group of dads. And some of those dads I'm still friends with. And, uh, well, ultimately another one, now that I realize that best friend who was riding her bike with me during these marathon trainings, that day that she had to leave my side with keeping me company on the training, uh, her now ex-husband was, was throwing her stuff on the, on the driveway. Uh, and, uh, oh, man. But I know of other organizations that I belong to, also very you know, moral upstanding citizens that have had quite a few divorces in the same period of time. I think, I'd like to think we made an impact uh, on those kids, you know, having barbecues with the kids at school, making school a fun place for dad to be. Oh, yeah, because that's not uh, normally... You know, we had an overnight, we had camp outs, you know, uh, overnight camp, camp outs uh, with the kids at school. We had uh, magic nights at the school. Uh, we had um, father-daughter dances, which uh, was not, you, you didn't hear about it before our first father-daughter dance. We'd never heard of anyone doing that except maybe the original dad's club that, that inspired this idea. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to think we made a, a pretty big impact. So that Griffith Park story that um, every time there was someone new in my office, and I have five people working with me directly in my cluster, and so, so whenever something came up about I got lost or this or GPS or but it, even a regional park, whatever triggers it, Hey, did I ever tell you about the time I got lost at Griff Park when I was six years old? And so finally, this last guy joined us, <coughs> and and the the one guy had never heard the story, and the other's like, enough already. The front page <laughs> of the LA Times, really? <laughs> Give me your credit card. I'm gonna go look up the LA Times. We're gonna find out if you tell the truth or not. He right? called you out. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, and he finds the article, and pays the dollar to get the archive, and sure enough, I'm in there. The article's attached to that email. But I'm, so I'm not on the front page. I'm on page three, you know, next page, you know, talks about the 66 firemen and countless policemen that were out all night looking for me and my buddy Buzzy. My brother did go with us. This is one of the times I didn't listen to his advice and he knew better this time. <laughs> and he, we, we saw this trail and we're like, hey, this is neat. Let's go back and get my brother, we'll go back, we'll get my twin and we get back to the same trailhead. And he goes, I don't know, man. I don't think we should go any farther or we're going to get lost. So he turns around. He goes back. This is Jewish Arbor Day, to be Shabbat, in February 1968. He goes back. And we keep going. And we got lost. And we came across a guy who was, like, packing up some. Maybe he was selling something or whatever. Said, get away from me, kids. I don't have time for you. He wouldn't even answer a question. So we just kept moving on. We didn't think to follow his car to see where he was going. And we ended up getting lost, and we got stuck overnight in Griffith Park. And uh, Buzzy, who, who my other coworker found on the internet when she saw the full name in the article, she's like, well, do you ever talk to Buzzy? Let's look him up. You know, so I ended up getting reacquainted with him. And he remembers this as a much, much more death-defying experience. Like, I included in my stories of survival, and he was, he was flat-out scared. <laughs> and, he, and I remember him being scared. And I tried to be brave for him. And he, he said, hey, can I have one of your candy cigarettes? I'm getting hungry. And, and I had this little stupid pack of candy cigarettes or bubblegum cigarettes. And I said, well, look, I'll give you one. We're going to have to ration them. We don't know how long we'll be lost. I'm six years old. <laughs> Eat funny. grass. It's good for you. <laughs> right? And then ultimately, when I became a vegetarian, I go to this place called Optimum Health Institute where one of the staples of your diet every day is wheatgrass juice. 
and that grass smells the same as that grass that I remember smelling the <laughs> night that I was lost in River Park, but it don't taste as good as it smells. And um, But it's uh, even when the kids were in high school, I was able to finally use this experience getting lost. You know, they'd ask me, hey, I drove the carpool, right? But like the one thing, the kids wanted to go to CFIS in middle school. And I said, as long as Maria... The gal who helped me get in that weight loss contest, who used to walk with me, as long as she d d agrees to drive you, you, I'll make sure you get in that school. Somehow, I'm going to make sure you win the lottery, because I always win, <laughs> and you're going to win, right? And so I got them in that school, and Maria's kid ends up on a different track, and so we go our separate ways, and I end up driving the carpool every day to school. And I, all I ask the other parents is if you'll pick up the kid, because I don't know what my schedule's going to be like in the afternoon, but in the morning, I will drive your kid, I'm going to go straight to the gym, and I'll go work out. So, uh, so the kids would ask for, uh, you know, if I could give someone a ride home, and the kid, new kid would get in the car, and they'd start to give me directions, and the girls would go, no, nah. and i just just tell them the address, watch what happens, right? Is I worked for the newspaper for 29 years, so I know I know where every address that was built before 2006 when I ended my career. Uh, 29 years I worked for that newspaper, so I know how wow. to find every address. Wow! And so they used to call me the, the human, basically the human GPS before GPS was a thing. <laughs> also, my dad was uh, was uh, gave me credit for a, a couple of things. Oh, we are late. Um, he gave me credit for two things. One is that uh, for saving my brother's life, and another occasion saving his own life. Excuse me. But the next time he survived something that could have killed him, he was inspired to write his confidential story about the top secret work he'd done for the defense uh, contractor in the late 50s and early 60s. It was about this uh, inertial navigation system that Lytton had patented. He was the project manager for this original GPS for fighter jets. When, when, when his work was documented and he submitted his, his report, they ended up with an order for like 2,000 of these for the F-4 fighter jets oh, wow. around 1960. And he told me, he said, they still use this invention that he perfected in commercial aircraft today as backup. On this trip to Israel, I met, uh, literally, uh, I, I, the dad came home, I met a rocket scientist, and while I was there, I met a rocket scientist. <laughs> and I mentioned this inertial navigation system to the fellow in Israel. He goes, you know, I'll tell you what happened in the early 90s when... The, the, we invaded uh, Iraq to, to free Kuwait, right? The, uh, you know, we knew that, that Iraq would launch their Scud missiles at, at Jerusalem and at Israel, and you know, we didn't know that he didn't have any, you know, warheads with, with uh, you know, biological weapons. We didn't know at the time. So they purposely made the GPS fuzzy, like the satellites, instead of being pinpoint accurate, like you could walk now to your next door neighbor on your GPS, but mm -hmm. then they made it like up to 200 meters of, of uh, discrepancy so that the missiles couldn't hit their exact target. So they'd have to be, oh, wow. you know, they'd have to come up with another, another method. So they used the INS, this inertial navigation system during that time, because they knew that our fighter jets could still pinpoint things, even though... The Iraqis wouldn't be able to. Saddam Hussein wouldn't be able to hit, hit his target. And so he validated what my dad had written, which I got on Wikipedia, which he said, I can die happy now because now you've made me immortal. <laughs> uh, so anyway, but in part because of that experience of getting lost, obviously I, I, I don't like getting lost anymore, so I made it a real point to know how to find things. Hmm. And... Uh, and I, and I was able to use that in my career as well as in my next career. I worked for the census for a little while, and I was in charge of mapping things wow. for the census. Is your dad still around? No, he died about seven and a half years ago. 
Uh, Dad and Mom reconciled on my wedding day, almost uh, exactly 10 years after we left Argentina. Um, I, I knew my wife's mother was going to walk her down the aisle. I pulled my mom and dad into a room. I said, this feud ends today. Like, you're both walking me down the aisle to the, to the, uh, you know, the, what we call the bima, the archway where, you, where I'm getting married in the synagogue. And you will shake hands, hug, whatever you have to do. But this ends today. They literally had not spoken to each other in 10 years. The last time was sure. in, in court. Bitterness. Duking and, it out, right? Oh, yeah. I can imagine. So dad agreed. Mom agreed. And dad would tell me years later, he said, you know, everyone was so nice to me at the wedding, except for your Uncle Jack. My mom's uncle, her, her mother's brother, was so mad that my dad had tried to take the twins away from their mother that uh, he was not going to forgive him. Mm. You know, and uh, so we we could reminisce about Uncle Jack, which and, and Uncle Jack's granddaughter turned out to be one of my mom's favorite people. They were still very close all the way to to, to the end. Um, cousin Jelena. So yeah, they reconciled and they and they became friendly. Mom still had a lot of bitterness and revenge um, speech in her writings, and certainly in her letters at the time. Um, but for my stepmother, uh, they got a, they got to meet, well, once at my wedding, because my little sister was two years old at the time. She was my flower girl, and she's almost 40 now. No, she's 40. She'll be, yeah, she's 40. And my uh, stepmother um, was very hospitable to my mother when, when, when one of my sisters died. And uh, and mom wrote about that, and she'd always ask about my stepmother. My stepmother would always ask about my mother, how she's doing. And so very interesting that they would have some common bond. And even when my dad passed away, now my mom still gets Social Security. She was getting Social Security, so her Social Security got bumped up to what dad's check was. Dad's wife's check got bumped up to what it was. That's how it works. That's also probably why Social Security's going broke, because yeah. both wives got the amount of the one check because she was only getting a few hundred before. And uh, so in, interesting that it, that that allowed her to live out not not all the money that she needed, but it was enough to, to cover her basic expenses, which is not really a thing for most Social Security checks. Right, right, right. So, but it helped. Yeah. There's one other thing I want to mention about... Uh, I think there's a reason why uh, I was inspired to help others, not just from my own experience. Uh, my own grandmother was recognized in the 1980s for the work she did in the 1940s to raise money for the state of Israel before it became a country. Oh, wow. Uh, so she was recognized by the L.A. County Supervisors. Uh, um, a few years before she passed away. She also died in 94, just like my mom was 94 <clears throat> when she passed away, um, you know, just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, mom was also inspired to be a volunteer, like her mother, and, 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 and she inspired her whole family because all of my aunts and uh, my, my aunt and uncle, just like my mom, were, were charitable and volunteered either time or money to various worthy causes. Um, when I was 19, I think I was put in charge of the United Way campaign at work. And so I spent over 20 years raising money for various nonprofits and worthy organizations that were trying to help people in the community. And people that didn't make a lot of, a lot of money would ask me, why should I donate to, to that? I said, well, look at it like insurance. Like you may not need this program right now, someone else does. But if you don't pay for it while well, you can support it when you need it, it may not be there. So, in fact, I worked Free Night Away for about three months. And when I lost the job at the newspaper, I asked them to let me go there, too, because I, I felt better raising the money as a volunteer than as a paid employee. It didn't feel the same. The motivation wasn't the same. 
So, and that comes into play with my work because, you know, parents will ask me if I'll talk to their kid while they're still in high school and provide some guidance to them and the kid before they get to college. And I might spend half an hour or more with, with a family and they ask me, what do I owe you? And I'm like, nothing. I, I don't understand. How can you make money if you're giving consultations for free? And so, well, you need to understand, I, I am in this work for life. So your kid's going to go off to college, may never need my help again. Well, then graduate. They got a hundred best friends. <laughs> yeah. Who they could tell, you know what, I got my loans under control. Better call Saul. He'll know what to do. Right? He'll help you. So I got time on my hands. I'll <laughs> wait for the referral. Um, and when my mom passed away, she had a, a, a neighbor who, who had never actually met her, a neighbor of my sister, agreed to come because you got like hours. In Jerusalem, you got one cemetery. You got hours to get someone buried, and that's how our religion is. So within six hours, we went from mom passed away to, to having her funeral. And her, oh. uh, this, this rabbi who spoke, my sister said, well, what do we owe you? Because he asked me a little bit about my mom. What could I share with him? And he, he took five minutes of conversation and was able to give a 14-minute eulogy about how great my mom was using the facts that I gave him, which was pretty inspiring, right? Yeah. So yeah. My, he, he told my sister, he says, I, don't, I, I did this as a, as a blessing. If you're inspired, if you think your mom would have been uh, a supporter of this cause, I have this... Uh, this, this uh, nonprofit, maybe you could, you know, maybe you might want to make an endowment. I don't know, you know, what her position was. So he has a, uh, a home in, in Israel that provides housing for abused foster girls. And another um, uh, piece where aged out foster girls turn 18, either be sent to the military or aren't able to serve and he can provide them housing until they're able to, 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 to serve. And uh, both very close to, to my heart wow. yeah. and to my mom. And, uh, and I have a, a woman here in town who, who runs a domestic violence education program for foster age kids and high school students. And of course, we were also inspired by another group who provides housing for aged out foster kids uh, throughout this community, and uh, so I said, "We'll we'll help you raise money for that, and I'll come back mm. on the anniversary of Mom's passing, which on the Jewish calendar is today, a year from today. So I'll be back to present a check a year from the day we're recording this uh, in Israel to uh, honor her her legacy." Wow, awesome! You know, it's um, the deeper you're affected by things in your life the stronger your perseverance and your attitude and your just wherewithal of making an impact on others and so for people that are out there experiencing something that is hard right now that is debilitating because it's overwhelming and you don't know what to do because of your emotions or because of you feel trapped or because of whatever it is that you're going through just know that that feeling that you have now will at some point be the power that is going to help you help others and it doesn't help that much right now when you're feeling this and when you're down and out but just know on the back of your mind that this is going to be the defining moment, a defining moment that will help somebody at some point in the future. And I think your story, there's so many different things that we touched upon and it really is a testament that that the thing that things happen for a reason and you experience things for a reason and you are kicked to the curb for a reason and it's not to hurt you. You, sometimes you have to experience it, but it's that's not the reason. The reason is because if you don't have that, if you don't feel the trepidation and the fear and the helplessness, if you don't feel that and it's real, then 
you won't have the gas and the steam to make it happen to help somebody else. It just won't be there. So, right. so you have to experience this. And I think that when your mother's passing, the best thing that you can do is leave a legacy for her. So her pain and suffering that she had to go through has a purpose and it gives you a purpose. And yep. so I think it's a great story. So Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Good stuff. By the way, if you're listening to the Move podcast, I never introduced myself because we just started talking <laughs> and just started going. And that's, you know, if you're listening to it, you probably know who I am. Uh, but Solomon Shapiro is my guest. And maybe I'll do a little intro <laughs> before just so people that start listening to it are like, what are these guys talking about? <laughs> but thank you for tuning in to the Move podcast. Is there any last thing that you'd like to say, Saul, to a message to get out there or anything that? Well, I do. You know, um, I've known you for a long time. I mentioned uh, before we started recording the podcast that were two defining moments for me that you did that inspired uh, my understanding and better love for what you stand for. And that was when you... Um, spoke about your son and what you went through and what you were willing to do to provide for him and to make sure he had a good life. And that was really inspiring, as well as one of the many events you've put on to help others in the name of just memories of people who have passed away. And it, 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 you don't know who you've touched. Uh, we never talked about it before, but it, it was impactful to me, and and and, it, and I really thank you for that. Awesome, man. I I believe that you are an inspirational person, thank and you. that people out there are going to be better off by listening to what you have to say and letting you help them. And and if there's somebody out there that has some kind of um, issue with their credit or they're trying to get student loans or they're trying to to manage student loans, I think that you'd be a great resource. And can you remind us one more time how somebody can get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, well, they can they can reach me on online, livingbetter101.com. As for Solomon, all those like the king. Um, you could you call our toll-free number. 844-844-3911 and uh, just remember better call Saul I'll try to help <laughs> the, um, the and, and we have uh, you know I'm on I'm online Facebook and, and Instagram and, and uh, Twitter what have you everybody listening or uh, not listening <laughs> we'll catch you on the flip side and I love you but I gotta leave you so until the next time See ya.